Welcome to the Trillbilly Workers Party, everybody. Uh, we have a very special guest for you today. Um, we are talking with professor of history at Northwestern University and also author of the book, How to Hide an Empire, uh, Daniel Imrevar. How are you doing today, Daniel? I'm okay. I'm okay. I feel like we're almost at the end of this and, you know, it's almost springtime in Chicago. So those two things match up in a really nice way. Yeah, yeah. It's um, probably, you know, if you're in Chicago, it's probably got to be a much more welcome spring because it's so cold there. So, Yeah, I mean, the line is that, you know, you'll never see a, a large group of people seized with such collective exuberance as Chicagoans when, you know, in the summertime because, you know, they know what they're missing. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, it's almost spring. But, you know, we had snow last week, so just... Just, yeah. a, just a reminder. Yeah, we did too. Um, winters in Chicago seem pretty rough. Winters here in eastern Kentucky are also pretty rough because everything's dead. So, I mean, it's kind of a double-edged sword here in eastern Kentucky. You know, in the summertime, everything's alive and lush. And you're like, this is the best place on earth. But the flip side of that is that everything dies in the winter. And so it's the most depressing place on earth. So it's pretty rough. Yeah. All right. You win. <laughs> <laughs> Um, well, Daniel, uh, I wanted to have you on because you wrote for The New Republic about this book that just came out. Um, it is in the genre of, what would you call it, like lessons from the Stone Age genre? Uh, paleo wisdom. Paleo wisdom. There you go. Um, and it's it's called Work. It's by this guy, James Sussman. Um, and we'll get to Sussman here in just a second. But I kind of just wanted to start out by asking you. Like, who are the San people of the Kalahari Desert, and why are they suddenly so important to our tech overlords in Silicon Valley? Yeah, it's rarely good when suddenly you've become important to our tech overlords in Silicon <laughs> Valley. Like that's not <laughs> that story doesn't usually end well, right? <laughs> uh, so the San people are more traditionally known are as the Bushmen. And although that sounds like that might be one of those old timey terms that we should avoid, actually, that is now a term that a lot of San people prefer and, and advocate. So we can use that as well. Um, but there's a lot of some sort of nomenclatural diversity around here. Um, so, but what they are is they are people who've lived in the Kalahari Desert for a very long time. Um, how long exactly is somewhat up for debate, but the the thing that is interesting or has been interesting up to a lot of people about the San or the Bushmen um, is that late into the 20th century, they were still foraging, meaning that they weren't practicing agriculture. They were getting their living from the lands by hunting and, you know, taking out tubers and, and you know, finding nuts and that kind of thing. And so, there was this line about the quote unquote Bushmen was that they were our best glimpse into the prehistoric past. If you wanted to see how humans were doing things, you know, 10,000 years ago, well, arguably, and we're going to talk about whether this argument is right or not, uh, they've been doing it the same thing for an incredibly long time. And so this is how we can actually see like our past. And it's in fact, one of the only ways that we can see our past because there aren't actually that many people who are still foraging. Right. Um, you know, you in the article, you talk about this movie that was popular in the 80s, The Gods Must Be Crazy. Um, I've, I've not actually seen the movie. I am aware oh. of it. <laughs> what is it like? Can you give us the Daniel Immervar movie corner review? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's a, for, first of all, like, there's just this way in which we throw stuff at kids that I don't know why we do that. So, I mean, I grew up like not only did I see this movie, I was shown this movie many times. Like this uh -huh. is they're like, this is a family friendly comedy and you should enjoy. So what it is, it's a it's a comedy. It's a comedy by a South African director. And the comedic element is that he actually gets um, Bushmen to be in the movie. And there's like this really sort of incredible actor who, um, who, who stars in it. And, and a lot of it's sort of this, like the, you know, the friction between quote unquote civilized life and, you know, busy, busy life in the office in Johannesburg. And then what it's like for these guys out in the bush who, you know, have a very different lifestyle. And so it's a, it's comedic. It actually lets you see Bushmen doing their thing to some limited degree. I mean, a lot of it's staged and it's somewhat sympathetic to the Bushmen, um, or at least it seems like that in that, you know, 
one of them is is the hero. Uh, the way it starts is that um, some pilots throw a Coke bottle, like a glass Coke bottle, out of the like out of the window because they're like done drinking the coke and they just like throw it into the bush and um this this group of bushmen finds it and then like they just go like this like completely unravels everything for them they're like fascinated by this object they get in fights over the object they start hitting each other with it and so one of them goes to throw it off the edge of the world and that's where he encounters you know white people and and you know comedy ensues from there right you know you you talk about the the actor in it, um, the director basically kind of exploited him, told everybody that like he had lived in this society, that they didn't know money. They had no awareness of the outside world. Um, but yeah, that these were basically false assumptions. Like the Bushmen knew about money. Um, they knew even about agriculture, but they had been, um, in many ways forced off their land and forced into the slums. Is, is that kind of an accurate... Yeah, I mean, it, it's in some ways worse than that. So the director, this guy, Jamie Ace, part of, you know, promoting this movie, and the movie was insanely popular. And, you know, it's not often that a South African comedy is an international sort of hit. And, you know, it's it's storming the, the, the theaters in the United States. But this is what was going on. And so what Jamie Ace did was said, you know, yeah, it's a like I'm basically getting this right. This guy, I, I plucked him straight from the bush. He'd never seen money before. I was the first or third white man he'd ever met. Uh, and and so this story that I'm telling about these sort of simple, quote unquote, primitive people versus civilization, that's right. I mean, I'm telling it in a sort of cute way, but like that's that's basically the re the, the real story. Which sounded, I mean, you know, people were interested in that. That made that made newspaper had you know that made good newspaper copy, but. Um, yeah, that guy lived for a while and anthropologists went to interview him and the story that he had to tell was completely different. He was like, oh yeah, yeah, I met Jamie Ace because I was um, well, I was working at a, as a cook uh, in the school and I actually met him when I was like making some bows and arrow sets to sell to tourists like him. Right. Uh, and so yeah, like, I was not, you know, and like, I don't live in the bush, like I, here's my house. Uh, so right. yeah, it just, it, you realize that there's this kind of myth making about um, the Bushmen that is just relentless. And in this case, you could just see it so clearly because the story that the actors had to tell themselves about their own lives was completely different from the story that the director had told about them. Yeah. Well, I mean, you, you write in your article that very few anthropologists t today would actually use these societies as windows on to the distant past. Um, but not all of them. That's right. Yeah, no, that's right. I mean, so the naive theory, and you c I mean, you could see why this is tempting if you don't know a lot about anthropology is to think, okay, well, how did humans behave in the deep past? I mean, that's a really interesting question. And, you know, the evidence that we have for it, you know, we've got like a few paintings that can be interpreted various ways. We've got some fossils. I mean, it's kind of hard to reconstruct someone's life. So you could see how it's really tempting to just be like, I mean, these guys look like they've been doing this for a while. So, right. I mean, why don't we just check out what they're doing? Right. <laughs> and like, that seems like, and that's our story. Um, anyway, it turns out that, that, I mean, that the, ba the basic assumption there is that you're looking at the Bushmen and you're looking at people who've been fossilized in time and that, right. you know, they're the past, you're the present. Yes, it's technically, you know, whatever year it is when you're the anthropologist there, the 60s or whatever for them too. But in some way, it's, it's, it's profoundly not the 60s yet for them. They, they haven't hit the 1960s yet. Uh, in fact, they haven't hit, you know, 1800 yet. Um, look, there's a lot of condescension in that view. And I mean, it just suggests that some people are sort of apart from history. And it turns out that the more we know, the less plausible we find that. So that would be a good kind of segue into talking about what it is about their their history and their lifestyles that makes it so attractive to Silicon Valley people. Um, and and so, you know, to do that, you talk about this book. It's by this anthropologist named James Sussman. Um, and the book is called Work, and it is a history of work. And when I saw this, you know, I mean, I consider myself more or less a Marxist. I'm not an expert or anything, but it is funny to think about the history of work from a standpoint that isn't necessarily, I don't even know what you would really call this. Um, but I mean, as you point out, like they don't, there's hardly any mention of slavery, of the gender division of work. <laughs> it's just like, yeah, dude, this is a guy who wrote a book about work, uh, like a history of work that doesn't discuss unions. <laughs> Just like think about that. You're like, okay, work. What are the topics? I mean, slavery too. That's a huge omission. Right. Uh, you know, like, 
I mean, it's it's kind of mind boggling. And the way he does it is, you know, he's sort of this like God tier, you know, galactic thinker where instead of, you know, asking the kinds of questions that we might ask, he zooms out as far as he can. So he's like, okay, you know, screw. I mean, like Marxists have been telling us a history of work for a long time. And usually that's about, okay, like how does capitalism affects work? You know, people transition to wage labor. He, by the way, James Sussman has very little say about these topics. Uh, and the reason is that he's like, okay, if you really want to get deep, like you really want to get into it, my friends, we're going to do the, the, the history of work for 300,000 years. <laughs> so it's, you know, a lot of it is prehistory and he's trying to reconstruct how people used to work, which isn't a terrible question, but it's a it's a weird move, right? Um, right. And particularly because he's really aiming it at the Silicon Valley set. Um, you know, it, it's supposed to get us up to the present. He's, he's sort of this, I mean, you, you say he's an anthropologist and, you know, I guess that's a generous way of describing it. Um, he's trained as an anthropologist, but then he, he sort of went rogue and, and he's a consultant. He has a consultancy firm, and he's very clearly like aiming for you know a post at Google or something like that, where he can pontificate about you know like the nature of labor. Yeah. Before we started recording here, I was telling you about this segment we have about you know deeply diseased. Um, and as I was reading your description of his consulting firm, I was like, man. That it doesn't really get more disease than that. Let me let me just kind of read here a little bit about it. Um, it's called Anthropos. It's a consulting firm that offers quote unquote thought leadership to organizations seeking quote unquote a competitive edge. Their clients include National Geographic, Sony, the European Commission, and uh, De Beers, the diamond company that he actually used to work for. Oh, De Beers, the diamond company. Yeah, what's that doing there? <laughs> what's that doing there? Look, what's that doing there? Yeah, I mean, I raised an eyebrow too. The thing is, I, you know, I'm a book reviewer. I got the book cold. Like, I didn't know who this dude was. And yeah. I started reading it and I, I just, you know, felt myself being irritated in the way that one is but like with inside baseball-y stuff like i write books he writes books like i can tell like game recognize game like i can tell when you're like not paying very close attention to the paragraphs you've written or that right. you're just kind of like hurting over some events <laughs> so initially i was like all right well it seems like we've got this sort of thing going on and it's kind of hard to bring up in a review you can't like be like all right guys just so you know this paragraph is really poorly constructed like no one really cares you know i mean right but anyway so but i just i was like i just feel like I want to know what's up with this guy. Like, what is this dude's problem? And it's it's fractally bad. Like, the the more you look, like at any scale, it's bad. Like, it, so, okay, what does he do? He he starts out as, um, you know, he's trained as an anthropologist. He doesn't really kind of work much as an anthropologist. He's he's immediately drawn to being a consultant, and so he works in Southern Africa. And one of the main issues in the area where he's working uh, in the Kalahari um, Game Reserve, uh, Central Kalahari Game Reserve, is uh, that the Bushmen are going to be, the governments want to displace the Bushmen. And one reason they want to do so um, is because they're diamonds that they've just discovered oh. on these lands that the Bushmen have been using. So, yeah, I mean, do you want to guess where this is going? Right. Because it's going exactly there, right? Right. Uh, so some whole debate ensues, like quasi-intellectual, but also fairly political about what kinds of, you know, um, claims can Bushmen have to land, right? It's not like they have title uh, that, you know, like that comes down through the Western system, uh, but they quite clearly ha should have some claim to this land. Uh, so James Sussman kind of, I think he bops around between positions, but the position he ends up on is that, um, interestingly, the idea of indigenous land rights sounds great, but actually is completely inapplicable in Africa because technically everyone's indigenous in Africa. Right. And therefore any claim you can make that the Bushmen have like deserve to like use or own or exclusively have this space is ultimately intellectually incoherent. And there you go, which turns out to be a highly convenient position to um, De Beers diamond mining, right. um, which a few other anthropologists point out, James Sussman's like, I mean, whatever, like, that's fine, but it's, it's the right position. So they're accusing him of being a shill. Uh, he's, you know, of course, you know, denying, denying this. That's a fairly serious accusation among anthropologists that you're just shilling for a diamond company. Uh, and anyway, after this, and, and so he says two things. One is I'm not shilling for De Beers and two, 
De Beers doesn't even want this land anyway. Like they're like they're not going to displace anyone. I'm just making I'm just making the right argument. This is right. not about displacing anyone. So anyway, two things happen after this argument all plays out. Uh, thing one is that uh, they do take the land. The diamond companies do take the land. James Sussman goes to work for De Beers full time, <laughs> <laughs> like at a fairly high level post. Yeah, it was like global director of public affairs or something like that. Yeah, it's one of those titles where by the time you get to the end of the title, you're already bored, you know? <laughs> like, right. yeah, manager of, of, of global imaging. I don't know, something like that. Yeah, so he works at De Beers for a while and... And it's just like there's just no hiding it, right? I mean, this is this is the use of anthropology for corporate privilege, and um, it, it turns out that those particular diamond mines don't pay out as well as they thought. But anyway, but it all pays out very well for our friend James Sussman, who works at De Beers, and I presume makes an enormous amount of money doing so. Yeah, you know, I think this will come back up later, or at least I wrote it down in my notes at a later point. But he actually quits De Beers. And you noticed, you noted this in your article. He basically quit because he was getting kind of bored and unfulfilled. Like, just sort of, like, you know, wondering about what his next bonus was going to be. And, and decided he needed to do something bigger and more important. I mean, that's what he said. Look, I don't know. I don't know the man. Um, we're not <laughs> close. Uh, but... <laughs> I, you know, I mean, I, I just, this is not, I have no information here, but uh, I often, if someone is like, leaves a high paying post and they're just like, I don't know, I just want to think bigger, man. Yeah. Like maybe that's true. Right. <laughs> you know, I don't know. I don't know what went on there. Um, but yeah, that was the story he said. He's like, oh, you know, just, it's just stupid. This corporate life is just dumb. Like all I'm thinking about is my next bonus. Um, and so then he's presented himself to the world as someone who is, you know, just, one of these sort of galaxy brains who, who wants to, you know, think outside the box. And he started up this um, consulting firm Anthropos. And now he's now the book is his sort of bid for, I mean, basically, I don't know if you know much about this guy who wrote Sapiens, um, you've all know Harari, but like, like it, you know, James Sussman is like aiming to be the, yeah. the next you've all know Harari. And, and that guy's had an incredible career, Yeah, you know, pontificating, writing these books about same thing, about basically the same thing about deep history and, you know, just getting kind of unconscionable amounts of love <laughs> from the Silicon Valley elite. Yeah. If I had to sum up the kind of thesis of Harari, I, and I've not read Sapiens, but I did read the New York pro New Yorker profile on him. Yeah, it's it seems that both Sussman and Harari's kind of thesis here is that the agricultural revolution was basically a mistake. Like we need to turn back oh, the yeah. clock. Yeah, <laughs> um, they're they're careful not to say that we're gonna you know we want to go back to you know foraging, but um, yeah, them and and the other person to add in here is Jared Diamond, right? Um, right. Who's been a you know kind of a. a, a a lurking presence in airport bookstores for a very long time now. Um, and yeah, the, the, what you hear from, from all of this trio is a story about, you know, the, the drastic wrong turn that humanity took uh, with the agricultural revolution. And, you know, it, it kind of, you know, it destroyed our diets. It, it forced us to, to work far more, far arduously than we ever had uh, and the benefits didn't really you know we still gave us diseases um and the benefits didn't really pay out for you know between until the 20th century that's and and even then you know there's a kind of just you know swamp of or fog of skepticism that surrounds the whole operation so it's interesting i mean that way it's a very you know critical take on you know modernity and everything that's tumbled out since um i'm not sure how much like useful social criticism that generates we can get into that um but but yeah that's the line they've all done and part of that that line is is to say and this is something that Sussman has really spent like double down on is that humans before the before agriculture had something called original affluence right like that they were doing i mean may, you know obviously they didn't have like a lot of stuff and you know their laptops were screw, screwed up but like but basically like they were happy and they had all they needed and they didn't have to work very hard for it so that's the line um it's called the original affluence thesis and Sus sussman's particular version of this which he's been really loudly trumpeting is that humans used to have at most a 15 hour work week right which yeah. you know big if true <laughs> <laughs> Sounds nice. I'd like a part of that. 
I would um, like a 15 hour work week too. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, you know, he wrote this book, Sussman wrote this book, uh, Abundance Without Affluence, I think was the name of him. And, um, yeah, same book. It's, it's honestly the same book. Like it's the same, same argument. The, it's just slightly, I mean, you can tell this is, this is like a repackaging operation more than a mm -hmm. rethinking or rewriting operation. Um, yeah, both books make the same argument. So, yeah, so, I mean, I kind of clicked on his website, and there's some choice cuts on here. There's some really choice cuts yeah, on here. Yeah, the website's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, like, I love the way it's kind of structured. Um, well, he's this, this got this newer website, but then you have like a web archive version of it. And I love that there's like oh, these... yeah there's like these blurbs of questions that kind of pop out at you. Like do traditional hunter gatherer economies offer any clues as to how we might approach some current economic and sustainability challenges? How different are consumptive and productive behavior to those of hunter gatherer? Is an economy based on giving possible? <laughs> Just yeah. Like these questions. Yeah. I mean, you know, those are the stumpers. <laughs> Uh, Look, I mean, they're not they're not insane questions. I, there is this sort of like corporate speak that in in that afflicts his website. And also, I mean, we should just say this. The man is terrible at website design. And right. I have a lot of sympathy for that. I mean, you know, <laughs> the most human part of him really. among us has a square space. You know, <laughs> right. Account. right. Um, yeah. But so, yeah, so he he subscribes to this idea of original affluence. Um, and so I, I kind of want to talk, and before we go any further, actually, just before we go any kind of further to zoom out a little bit and talk about original affluence, in your article, you linked to this New York Times interview with him that was like, tell us five things about your book, Abundance Without Affluence. And I don't know if you noticed this, but the last question, they were like, who's one of your biggest influences? And he said, Lenny Riefenstahl. And I was like, whoa, what? What? <laughs> Wow. <laughs> Nazi propagandist. Uh, <laughs> I feel very embarrassed for missing that. Yeah, I didn't know if you had noticed that or not, but I, I knew that um, if you had seen <laughs> you would probably have the same reaction I did. Look, you know, I think this guy is ideologically odious in ways that we're going to get into, but I mean, he's not a Nazi. I mean, it's not it's not right, that kind right. of vibe, right? Right, right, right. It's, right. it's, it's, it's a different... Yeah, it's a different flavor. But okay, yeah, go his, on, go. On. His yeah, his. I think his um, thing for Lenny Riefenstahl was more for her sort of aesthetic. Photo He's like a photographer too. That's true. Yeah, yeah, and he actually has this like um, interest in a lot of the sort of older f photographers of you know of the global South Africa, right. you know, um, and and he he gets into it, and you know, I mean there's a way in which we can look at those photographs today and, and sort of cringe. Um, and I think that's one of Sussman's gifts is that things that we might cringe at, he's like kind of into. Right. Um, and partly maybe because he doesn't have quite the same instincts as, at least as I do, but, but he's also, you know, he's, he's able to say like, it's actually really cool to see these old photographs of Bushman. And I'm sure that there's something, you know, in the Imperial gaze of the photographer that, you know, brings up problematic assumptions or, or whatever they're hiding the fact that these people are actually engaging with modernity in all kinds of ways. But um, I mean, Sussman's interested in knowing how um, indigenous people or foragers lived in the, in the 20th century. Uh, wow. And, you know, some of that old ethnographic photography is actually gives you some clues of that. Right. <clears throat> yeah. I mean, I, I, I watched this lecture he did. Uh, you had linked to in, in there. And, um, He's a smooth talker, right? Yeah, he is. He really is. Um, yeah. It, I was really kind of shocked that his speaking style did not mirror his website building style. But again, that no, I the website is, is, <laughs> yeah, he tells on himself on the website. Right, right. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the original affluence thesis. Like you, you had talked about how this is actually an old idea, um, kind of dating back to the 60s. Um, and there were a pair of anthropologists that kind of put this idea forward and, and then... Uh, kind of, you know, talked about it a little bit more through this conference in the 1960s called Man the Hunter. Um, so <laughs> let's talk a little bit about the original affluence thesis. Like, what were, who were some of these people and what, why were they looking into this? Yeah, so, 
it's kind of amazing that we would be talking about an academic conference that was held in the 1960s, that that would still seem relevant, but that really is the way to have this discussion. So yeah. um, the old, you know, wrong, bad, old version of uh, what foragers are like is that they're the, you know, you know, they're the kids who failed class, right? They never like figured out modernity and now they're stuck in these like awful backward ways. Uh, and I mean, they're kind of interesting to an anthropologist, but but mainly because how much they suck. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, that was the kind of prevailing wisdom of, you know, popular wisdom. And I think it, you know, kind of was both encouraged and and also informed of some, some anthropological studies. Um, then the, the Man the Hunter conference, I mean, Look, this conference got written, I forget if it was time or life, but this this is like the conference that was big enough that at the time it got written up in like one of those big <laughs> magazines or like like a like a two page review of like the man the hunter conference. Back when they still wrote about conferences in, in... Jesus, yeah, that has not happened at any <laughs> academic conference I have been at and it didn't even come close. Right. Um so so the but the idea was to sort of collect a lot, you know, to collect the sort of revisionist take on foraging societies. So foraging is another way to in a shorter way to say hunter gatherer. Um and the the new emerging take, and there was a, a guy particularly named uh, Richard Lee, who's was one of the editors of the Man the Hunter conference volume and, and one of the conveners of the conference and, and a really important figure uh, for Sussman. The idea behind that Lee had and a lot of other people around him, like Marshall Solons and other big anthropologists had, uh, was that actually the foragers are getting it right. Like they're not they're not the screw ups, they're not the fuck ups. Um, that they have some way of life that actually holds up pretty favorably when compared to modern conditions and the the big thing there was the work hours so right. you, you know you it's at the same time everyone's you know it's like 1960 everyone's like oh my god my job is hard and you know i'm working in the office and you know the wife doesn't understand me it's like still that kind of vibe is happening you know uh and and then these anthropologists come out and they say look we've spent a lot of time in Latin America, in Southern Africa, in in fairly, you know, quote unquote, remote places um, with people who don't, this is what they said, don't seem to have a lot of interaction with modernity, have been sort of isolated or insulated or protected from, from all these kinds of transformative processes that have mangled our lives. And they're cool, like they seem pretty happy. And also they just take it easy. Like, you know, okay, they do, like they just get their food. Food is pretty easy to get and then what do you need after that? Like you're done, like day done. You can just kind of like fuck off. Um, right. And and that sounded pretty amazing. Yeah, I mean, I mean, it still sounds good. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. Um, you know, and so I don't know. I think that you kind of point this out. It seems like Susman kind of takes it a little bit further, though. Um, these these anthropologists said that there was kind of a twelve to nineteen. Uh, hour work week, but then they had to kind of revise it upwards a little bit. But um, Sussman still kind of clings to this 15 hour work week. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, following this guy's footnotes was was absolute agony. And it was only uh, motivated by the fact that I was so pissed at him for the De Beers thing that I was like, willing, I was like, all right, we're going to get to the bottom of every one of these footnotes. Like, where where is your evidence coming from, my friend? Right. Yeah. So I look, let's just say this. Both Sussman's books are really founded on this 15 hour notion, which is really attractive, really interesting. And he's, you know, made, you know, got a lot of news coverage for it. And it's just wrong. It's just like deeply wrong. And it's like not correct. And there's no reason to think it's right. And like, I like, I don't know how to say that more. It, it is in a very technical sense, bullshit. It is, right. it is speaking out interest in whether the fact that what you're saying is true or not. Um, and, and the, you know, it's not com like totally out of, out of the air, but what happened here's, here, here was the chain of, garbling that happened. So this guy, Richard Lee had done also worked on, on the Bushman and, and had done these studies and, and, and said, ah, it's somewhere ballpark 15 hours. Like th that's their work week is 15 hours. And then, you know, and that was, that was lower than anyone else had found in, in their other studies of other people's, but okay. Like w one place, it seems like it's 15 hours. Um, and that, you know, and you know, that, that, that figure got, got a lot of play. Uh, and then, you know, the anthropologists had their like, next level revisionism and they're like really like like it seems like you're romanticizing these people a lot and and they had these huge arguments about it and two things happened <clears throat> uh first uh well three things happened first richard lee went back and said okay actually it wasn't 15 mm -hmm. hours it was more like 20 hours uh and then he said and yeah okay i'm actually only counting the hours that it takes them to get food 
Right. Which you're like, right. That's <laughs> like, think about how many hours of your day you need to get food. Right. Like, it's not all of them. Like, there's a lot of the working that you do is necessary, but is not necessary on what anthropologists would call your food quest. Right. right. Like, the food quest, at least for me, is like, a fairly small part of my working week, but then like, I also have like a shelter quest and I also right. have a, you know, I don't know, whatever. Like, um, so, so that, so you're, and you just realize like, he's like, no, literally how long does it take you to get the food into your house? And they're like, okay, well, a lot of the, sh the, the nuts that they're eating, like are incredibly hard to grind up. And he's like, yeah, I wasn't counting any of the time it took to grind the nuts. <laughs> they're like, well, okay, that seems like that's relevant. <laughs> okay. Uh, so like, what about like, he's like, yeah. And you, you know, you killed an animal and you brought it back. They're like, well, what about you have to like butcher it and clean it? And he's like, I wasn't counting any of that. They're like, okay, right. well, that also seems relevant. What about water? What he's like, I was just counting the food quest. They're like, okay, well, for a lot of these people, there's a fairly significant water quest too. Right. And that seems, I don't know, important. So Richard Lee was like, okay, adding up all that stuff. Now we're talking about like 42 hour work week, which is by the way, less than people in the United States do for paid work. And then even that, so that's like two things. First of all, my number wasn't even right for the food quest. Second of all, right, the food quest is not everything. And then all these other anthropologists, no, like went through the data or were there with Richard Lee, including the best thing is his <laughs> wife was there with him. His wife is also an anthropologist and yeah. she wrote this book that is different. And one of her things was, <clears throat> dear, I noticed that in counting first food quest hours and then your expanded 42 hour non food quest hour count, you didn't mention child care. Right. The dude didn't count child care. I mean, <laughs> I guess it's different if the kids are just like hanging out with you. But like, obviously, that is a major form of labor that we do. Right. And so his so Richard Lee's wife, Nancy Howell, you know, she like just pointed out all these other things that are not part of any part of her husband's accounting. And then she also pointed out something. She's a sort of does medical work. And she's like, well, you know, I like weighed these people and, you know, checked out their health, not just like their working hours. And they're not healthy. Like right. they were, they had, this is her words, gnawing hunger, and they tended to die at age 30 and right. often from disease that were compounded by malnutrition. And once you get that in view, you're like, yeah, it's not like they have an easygoing 15 hour work week. Oh, the, sorry, not to go on. But the other thing she noticed, she was like, yeah, there are some times when they're just hanging out, not doing much, but also it's a very hot environment and they're kind of exhausted. And like, you can't be doing things all the time. Like part of that is just like recuperating from what sounds like a really kind of not easy life. Anyway, so this is not news. Like all of this had played out and, you know, anthropologists gone back and forth and that's how scholarship works and it's great and I love it. And like, you know, they'd all had this debate and then, and then God's perfect idiot, James Sussman comes in. He's like, <laughs> hey, did you guys hear that <laughs> the Bushmen only work for 15 hours? <laughs> Like no one thinks that anymore. So it's, that's where we are. That's where we are. And now there's all these like fucking like peace in the guardian. It's like Jane Sussman discovers that Bushman only worked for 15 hours. I mean, and the thing is he did some ethnographic observation uh, in Namibia, I believe, but like that was not with people who were foraging. That was people with people who like remembered that they used to know people who had foraged. And then James Sussman comes back. He's like, not just Bush for 15 hours. He's like all humanity used to only work at most 15 hours. Right. Which is just such a level of bullshit. Like, I mean, I, you know, and look, it's not that I have like another hour, like work timesheet that I have like filled out for all of humanity, but 15 hours, <laughs> like there's no evidence for that. Um, there's no evidence, but there's an enormous amount of confidence. So the guy is just flying. And, you know, it's just one last thing. The other thing that he does is even Richard Lee would, you know, he's, he would say, okay, you know, these guys work 15 hours that I hung out with, but what does that mean for our prehistoric ancestors? He's like, it's suggestive and maybe they didn't work that much. Maybe there's original affluence, but he's kind of careful about how he said it. James Sussman will just go there. He has written this. He says, hanging out with the Bushmen is like visiting the stone age, <laughs> which is like, every, like anthropologists would like commit suicide if they had accident, like a real anthropologist, if they had accidentally written that sentence. Right. Um, and so he's just, he just goes there, man. I mean, he's, you know, I admire the confidence. Yeah. Well, it's kind of, and I know this isn't a, an exact one-to-one, -one, but kind of where I'm going with this, it, it makes it relevant. I'm, I'm sure you're aware of like J.D. Vance, right? And like Hillbilly Elegy and all this. Yeah. It's, it, I don't know why, but it kind of rem reminded me of that because J.D. Vance's entire 
book, his entire shtick. We, we've talked a lot about it on the show, but it is a revived argument um, from the '60s. The you know sort of culture of poverty argument that that, that um, people are in poverty because there is a culture of it. Yeah, yeah, it's been discredited or whatever. But he kind of does the same thing that Sussman does. He just kind of latches onto the idea and is, and just kind of runs with it very confidently. Um, but you know. It, one of the reasons why I was kind of also interested in talking with you about this um, is because, as I mentioned before we got on here, a lot of these same ideas that are popular in Silicon Valley, like this one, for example, they get taken up and um, sort of proliferated in all of these other <clears throat> regions and areas where they're trying to use tech innovation as economic development. So I was joking with my buddy Tom, you know, our co-host on the show. I was like, I wonder how long it's going to be before these like tech people, they start looking at like hillbillies in Appalachia as like their next like, oh, that that's the lifestyle that we need to that they have a simplified lifestyle they make their own corn liquor they bathe in the creek <laughs> like, like that's who we need to be trying to because like i don't do you remember like the raw water thing it was like a craze in silicon valley for oh, a brief yeah. time yeah so let's talk let's just pause and let's talk about why this is so attractive to silicon valley yes. like let's connect that dot yes, yes. um because it's um, you know on the it's great okay humans only worked for 15 hours, like, cool. Uh, why would Silicon Valley care about that? Right. Um, and you can see, I mean, Sussman is just like, you know, he says the quiet parts out loud in some way, or at least on the website. And so you can sort of see how he's, how he's has making, trying to make this as a case to Silicon Valley. And the portrait that he gives you of forage in society sounds a lot like startup self-image of themselves. They move quick, they break things, like they adapt, um, they're egalitarian, they share stuff, you know, and you think of like software sharing and like all that stuff that's been really important to the self-identity of Silicon Valley. Uh, and he's like, and, you know, they're not bureaucratic. Like they don't fuck around with paperwork. They just like, they get what they need done and then they're done. And then like, they know they're done and, and, and that's it. And like, you know, there are like Silicon Valley books out there, like the four hour work week right. that are just kind of all about that. Right. It's right. like, that's the, that's the self identity of the entrepreneurs is, you know, they, they're, they're quick, they're adaptable. Um, they have like appropriate technologies. Like they figured, they figured out how to work in their environment. Uh, and, and then like, you know, they don't have to like put in like extremely long hours. Um, so it's a weird moment where like the prehistoric and the post-industrial are kind of like mapped onto each other. So I think that's part of the attraction, but I think the other part of the attraction is the ability to just like, look at all this crushing economy that a lot like this, just like a lot of people have shitty jobs or not enough jobs and, and, you know, are having a hard time making a living and just look at that and be like, Oh yeah, man, that's bureaucracy. Right. Like, that's just like, that's just like what happens when you let like the idiots in charge and like, but actually like the real economy, like, you know, for like true, the true economy, just like run by people who are like actually obeying the laws of the market is going to be quick, efficient and like, and easy. So, so in some ways economic problems are solved and it's just a bunch of like red tape that's getting in the way. I think that's the vision. And that's not my understanding of why the economy like is not working for everyone. <laughs> uh, it's like a, it's a very flattering understanding for the people who are at the apex um, because it doesn't blame them in any way. It suggests that people should emulate them. It suggests that they're, like they're doing it right and everyone else is an idiot and that's why everyone's poor. Right. Um, and, you know, and there's no sense of like, I mean, I, you know, and also if you're telling a story about foragers, they're completely, individualist and Sussman like really emphasizes this. Like they don't depend on large scale social operations. Like for all they do, they just, they just set them down and like, they, you know, they like, you know, go hunting and, and like with a bow and arrow and then they're done. Um, and so this idea of like these like small bands of um, really sort of admirable people who can fend for themselves. I mean, I think that's how these companies look at themselves without any understanding of like all of the public investment that's gone into you know, building the infrastructure, the educational system, everything that sort of allows them to have this predatory position in the economy. Yeah, it kind of makes me wonder, I feel like a lot of these tech, you know, geniuses or whatever, they were kind of, they were almost sort of acculturated in a world 
where it was sort of vaguely generally acknowledged that like corporations were just bad and like ruining the yeah. planet but they themselves they can't really admit that um that their own businesses are subject to the coercive laws of cap competition or whatever and so they yeah. have to develop yeah. these i don't know it's it's like you said to me before we started recording it's they're working their ideology out in real time and it's just fascinating to watch yeah no i think that's right i think i think what you have to get about silicon valley is it's anti-corporate Right. But like they yeah. hate corporations. Right, right. And of course they are corporations and that's, but like that the whole line is we're different. We're slimmer, we're smarter. You know, we don't do the, like we're not Ford. You know, we're not General Electric. Like those were the dumb old bad corporations that gummed up the economy. Uh, and and we're, you know, like they're the like brontosauruses and we're the velociraptors or whatever right. it is. Um, and and that's right. And so, you know, I think the the Stone Age you know, tribe is like a very good self image for them. Um, but it's an inaccurate image, of course, because, you know, if you're looking at this, not from the top, but from the bottom, you're like, these are like massive corporations. <laughs> like right. they're, they're absolutely enormous. And to think of them as just like, like these like live little things that move fast and solve <laughs> problems. Like that's just not true. I mean, at this point, um, like Amazon is quite literally its own nation state at this point. I mean, they are... <laughs> Um, but it's, and, it's also and, and, and an Amazon warehouse looks nothing like a Stone Age group <laughs> as described by James Sussman. <laughs> Just like, the, but and yet, the, and yet, that's the master ideology, right? That's the ideology for the people who are running Amazon. That's how they think of themselves and their and their small community. And you know, and it's not a bad like I get why they think that way um, because it feels like that to them because it's just like they work in a small in small groups and fairly, fairly like sharing based things where they're just like breaking rules and solving problems. Like that's how it feels to them. Yeah. I also kind of think, and this is, I think this is very much the case with um, Harari and Jared Diamond, but I think there's also this idea that um, this awareness that climate change is real and that the sort of ecosystem is changing. And, and I think Sussman said this or Harari said this, one of the two, I can't remember, but they seem to acknowledge that history is kind of at a pivot point, um, at least in terms of our sort of ecological limits. Um, and, you know, various tech overlords work this out in various ways. Like Elon Musk's ob way is obviously Mars. It's like, well, we've exhausted all of our frontiers here. We'll just expand them into space. But it seems like for others, it's like, well, well, let's just roll back the clock because everything wrong with the world now. And this is even kind of the case. I, I don't want to mischaracterize this because I've not read the book, but I did read Jed Purdy's review of it. But it seems kind of like this might be the case with James C. Scott as well, that like all of our current hierarchies and social relations are a result of the original sin of the agricultural revolution. And so if we could just dial back the clock to before that time. Like you had a great quote. If, if I can remember it, um, basically, like if you zoom out this far, if you if you take the deep perspective of deep history, it allows you to sort of ask the questions about human nature rather than you know the problems before us now. Yeah. So I mean, if you we have this phrase, right? We say that someone missed the forest for the trees. Right. And what we're saying there is like, there's a thing to see, it's the forest, but you idiot, you couldn't see it because you're so obsessed with botany and with individual <laughs> trees that you missed forestry, which is like the big story. Okay. So that's, that's like, that's right. Like people make that cognitive error a lot. And it's frustrating when we do. And we, and we, we appropriately revere and ad admire the far seeing thinkers who don't make that error. But there is actually another error that goes in the other direction, which is that you miss the forest for the galaxy. <laughs> like you zoomed out so fucking far that you yeah. can't see the forest. All You've you gone see galaxy is the pale brain. blue dot. Yeah, exactly right. And that's that's what's going on with a lot of this literature is like the the way that they're not talking about capitalism and the way that they're not talking about, you know, this particular configuration of capitalism that we've got going on right now is they've zoomed out so far and they're just like, oh man, it's all the agricultural revolution. Right. You know, and they also see themselves as so disconnected from these forces of history that they can map themselves onto the prehistoric past and like be like, yeah, that's basically what we're about. Uh, right. So so it's it's such a weird thing, but, but you see it so clearly in Sussman, right? Because 
look, you know, it's cool to work on a lot of different scales. And, you know, I'm a historian. I mean, it's like, it's, it's, it's useful to, you know, we're talking about something in the present. It's useful to be like, all right, record scratch. How did we get here? You know, right. and often what's useful about that is that, you know, one thing that power does is it, it tries to convince you that, that everything is natural, right? That the way we're doing things is, is kind of mandatory. There's not really an alternative. This is either how humans have always done it, or this is how the laws, what the laws of supply and demand require. And it's really useful to just be like, Oh, it turns out that, you know, uh, we didn't used to look at people with different skin color and and understand them as to be racially different. Uh, and you're like, oh, really fascinating right. Tell me about that. And, you know, so like it helps us kind of denaturalize a lot of the present. But what um, so so I'm into that kind of, you know, looking back move. But but what Sussman does, especially with labor, it just feels so crazy is by by looking so far back. Everything that would seem really relevant to me to talking about labor, including the things you mentioned, slavery, um, the gender division of labor, unions, all that kind of stuff, that just becomes a smudge on the side of the canvas. It's it just like, it's just a little detail. You don't need to talk about it because the real story is, I don't know, I guess we're working too much because we didn't used to have to work that much. Right. And that just seems like a, such an uninterest, like it's A, untrue, but also B, like sort of uninteresting. <laughs> it doesn't give you a lot to go with because I mean, how do you personally take that as that as advice? Like you're like, oh, maybe I should, yeah, you know, work less. <laughs> like you have a say in at Walmart. Like, like yeah, exactly. I mean, I mean, there are CEOs for whom that is right, literally advice. Like they're always telling each other, like, yeah, maybe you should like go to the Caymans more often, man. Like uh, that really like help you like vision <laughs> things better. But like for most of us, like that's just not that like just being like, oh yeah, I should work less. Like that's not like a choice. Right. Um, and it feels kind of offensive. I just in a minor way, just to like come being like, all right, man, I've looked at like all of work and all of human history. And my advice is take a break. Right. Be good to yourself. Like, right. Well, I mean, it kind of gives away the ball game, like who this is actually for. I mean, it's not for the working stiff, you know, it's. And, you know, to his credit, Sus Sussman doesn't just deliver this as, as advice. He's like, maybe we're organizing our, our work lives in crazy ways. Like maybe there is just like needless amount of work that we're doing, which I mean, I'm sure that's true. Um, but boy, is this not a book that, that gives you any view on how you might get there? Um, because you're basically just left with being like, all right, I guess I should think big, you know, yeah. think outside the box. Like, It kind of strikes me that, <clears throat> you know, and I don't know if this is a, a, an accurate characterization or not, but earlier when I said like it was kind of key that he left De Beers because he was kind of unfulfilled I kind of feel like a lot of these guys they reach a certain level of success and they're just not sure why or what comes next and so they have this sort of like general restlessness or you know they're, they're always searching like Twitter Jack going to meditate you know in yeah Myanmar yeah, or yeah, whatever. yeah 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 they they I don't know I mean it, it must be weird to get really rich really quickly Right. Like that must just be very, I, I, I'm, this is not, you know, an enormous amount of sympathy because there's a very quick solution to getting rich very quickly, which is to just give your money to somewhere useful. <laughs> right, um, right. But, but nevertheless, like, you know, and, and also that feeling of power has got to scramble your brain in some way. Like, like, yeah. I mean, not, not just, uh, not, I'm not saying that in the sense of like, make you stupid, although power usually does that, but like, it just must be weird. Yeah. Oh, to wow. realize you're like, oh, like some like minor hack to my algorithm could have affected the 2020 election or 2016 <laughs> election. Like, that's a weird feeling totally for a tech pro to have. Right. Uh, and so, yeah, I think, uh, you know, and especially because their their social position is so new, like these people are insanely rich. They're young, like their parents were not rich like them. They, they can't, it's very hard to look to like, like, who do you look to? If you're Zuckerberg, like as a role right. model, like the guy who founded Napster, like like you don't have a lot right. of options. And and so that's, I think, part of the way in which these guys are like figuring out their ideology on the fly. Like, I mean, they're answering questions and and yeah, and I, and I think looking for meaning. And there's this like market for intellectuals who can kind of deliver meaning in some way and, and can pontificate in, in both ways that seem legible and useful to to the tech bros but also can like transport them and like supply. I mean, a lot of these guys didn't go to college. Right. <clears throat> Do you know what I mean? Like they were already like cajillionaire or right. on their way to be. And, and so, so I think, I mean, I actually kind of, there's a lot that I like about Yuval Noah Harari. I think he's um, 
less annoying in the ways that Diamond and um, Sistman are annoying. And and he's actually he's a wonderful writer. Um, I think he plays fast and loose with a lot of stuff, but whatever. Um, but like one of, I mean, he meditates like an insane amount of hours per day. And but, and it's kind, it's probably great to just like have this soft-spoken Israeli historian who's like looked at the deep past, just like, <laughs> you know, telling you fun and weird stories about pre prehistory and then like, you know, advising you to meditate. Right. Well, that's the kind of, that's kind of what I was going to bring up next. It's like, once you actually get to sort of the prescriptive parts of this, like Harari kind of has some um, suggestions, you know, like med meditation, for example. And veganism, but, that's another one. Yes, veganism, right. But if you're talking about like Sussman or Jared Diamond or, or even like maybe James C. Scott, it's like, well, what do you do? We can't roll back the clock to before. We can't just stop producing agriculture on an industrial scale. We can't return to foraging societies. Like, so like, what, what is the ask here? I don't know. That, that's the thing. Yeah, no, I think, I mean, with Sussman and Diamonds, they are kind of interested in producing some sort of advice. You know, I think Harari is, is, more thoughtful about how he how he does this and and his advice is mainly therapeutic and he's very okay with that right um i mean diamond i feel like diamond has just become a complete embarrassment um since he kept going after guns germs and steel but i mean diamond stuff will, will tend to be like you know let your kids roam a little more right uh, i mean just they're like <laughs> all right so man, banal. Thanks, dude. yeah no i mean yeah yeah he's a he's a paragon of adequacy <laughs> at this point um <laughs> You know, I think an interesting thing is you mentioned this guy, James C. Scott, who's a professor at Yale and, and is actually one of the most cited social scientists in, in our, in our who's, who's still alive. Like, I mean, he's, his, use, his work has been useful to a lot of people. And he and David Graeber, who's um, this both anthropological theorist and also, you know, arguably the lead activist behind Occupy Wall Street. Right. Um, and certainly the guy who came up with We Are the 99% is the slogan. Um, those those guys have been an, a sort of anarchist wing of studying the deep past. Um, and and I think that's actually much more productive because the reason that they're interested in the way far back is that they're interested in the origin of states and hierarchies and they want to denaturalize that. And at least for Graeber, there's a, that's related to a present practice of you know, helping ourselves, you know, kind of realize that a lot of the kind of work lives that we buy into is, is not necessary. And then, I mean, he has a sustained practice of activism that is built around his sort of anarchist philosophy that comes out of a study of the deep past. So, so I think there can be moves to make, but you're right. A lot of the time you zoom out that large and, and what you're left with is just meditate and wow, our relationship with animals <laughs> is really weird, which is both of which are like true. Right. Right. Well, that kind of gets at the maybe this sort of like destination point for this, or the or the end point for all this. Like, why is it so important to have uh, an examination of deep history, but from a perspective that asks some of these questions about yeah the true nature of labor? Like, what can it impart to current leftist movements and and movements to change our mode of production? Yeah, well, I think there's actually a lot that deep history could do. Um, so I don't think that looking at the far distant past is always the wrong move. Um, one obvious thing it could do is it could lead to a really rich and about labor among men and women. Um, and I think, you know, we that's a conversation we unfortunately keep needing to have. Um, and I would love to know, you know, what we can know about from prehistoric societies about how that's gone down, why it's gone down that way, what what the introduction of states did to that, what the introduction of agriculture did to that. Um, so those are some 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 really big questions. Um, you know, and another thing that's interesting is that a lot of human history, once you start looking back, has involved slavery or something like it. Um, and so thinking about why that's the case, uh, when that started happening, why it started happening, how we got out of it. Those are really interesting questions to ask, and they feel to me to be more kind of politically relevant um, than just, you know, are we working too hard? Right. Yeah, I think that at one point, Sussman, or maybe it's Harari, I can't remember, one of the two says, um, you know, these foraging societies didn't gather surpluses. Um, they were, yeah. the environment provided everything for them. Uh, at the time and so they weren't worrying about what was going to happen a week from now and and 
in that this you know drive for surplus is what gave rise to hierarchies and in, in other things um and yeah that's or go ahead that that's a part of the original affluence thesis is that right. um people aren't driven by a fear of tomorrow they have a kind of happy-go-lucky attitude which by the way maps really well onto silicon valley yeah right because yeah. they are they are not about <laughs> storing surpluses they're very comfortable going into deep debt i mean they just have a sense that the world is going to provide for them and you know it kind of does right yeah um you can kind of see why this kind of thinking is so not just popular with the Silicon Valley people, but also with people that listen to like the Joe Rogan show, for example. Yeah. I mean, like this is I advice that's just kind of so vague and broad that you can apply it to your life in the sense that like, oh, yeah, maybe I am working too hard. Um, but it, it does kind of divert it moves the goalpost or it kind of diverts your rechannels your maybe frustration with that problem somewhere else because then you can say well i'm not working 60 hours a week at walmart because of capitalism but because of things that maybe took place 50,000 years ago because of the agricultural revolution <laughs> You know what I mean? Like, what right. a blame shifting operation! <laughs> right. And I'm not saying it's wrong, but like, that's a weird politics you've got, where you're like, this right. job sucks. <laughs> oh man, I wish we'd never gathered in city states and right. started growing grain. This blows. <laughs> like, you know, like it doesn't give you a lot of leverage. Right. Right. But it, but it is fun to like smoke weed and think about deep time. I think that's partially the the appeal. <laughs> I mean, I like it too. I mean, it's no, I, I yeah, I don't deny that. The pleasures of that um yeah i just no and that's and it's whatever i mean like it's not like you've committed a crime if you've written a book about prehistory that like all it just you know leads to is like hey there used to be lift different kind of humans and they used to do make make funny axes and uh right yeah maybe maybe don't eat so much meat like right that, like that's fine but 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 now that we're like noticing how it's becoming the ideology of this like new like tech bro master class like i think we can like point to the limit of that as like a good description of our work lives yeah yeah well it's interesting you know just on the kind of like last note here um there is like leftist theory like for me marxist theory is kind of um fun in the same way that getting stoned and thinking about deep time is like you read capital and it's like taking apart the commodity for example like that joe rogan would love that if you could just get on joe rogan and tell him about like oh here is the uh, process of you know fetishization yeah. of the commodity oh, i want someone to explain to joe rogan they're like okay first it's m then it becomes c <laughs> then it becomes m prime which yeah, is more would, money yeah. which is more money yeah. right Right, you just shifted between modalities. His brain, he he would love that. He no, he would love that stuff. Man, yeah, I mean, <laughs> I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. Where you go? I'd love that image. I love that. Image. Yeah, I don't know. Um, but I don't know. It's a, it's a, it, it to me is just as fun to um, you know, think about that uh, than it is to, you know, ask some of these like questions that you, yeah, like you said, you're not going to be able to do anything about the agricultural revolution fifty thousand years ago. Right. I mean, I think that, you know, gives the question of like, what is theory for? Right. And, you know, part of what theory is for is is because it's fun to think about the world. And it is fun to just be like, man, everything around me, that's because the Treaty of Westphalia, you know, like that, right. like there is something that like that, that enriches our world. It really does. And like, if it were just that, then, then, you know, that would be enough. But, but ideally, you know, theory, not just kind of is a series of like just so stories that help you like, come up with explanations, but, but that those explanations might reasonably guide your action and like, might give you a sense of like, Oh, like what should we really be targeting here? And like, where should I like invest my energy and like, what's a good way to do that. Um, and I guess what disappoints me about a lot of this sort of, you know, look forward by looking to the deep past lessons from the stone age stuff is that it doesn't have that second component and it kind of crowds out like, like it's amazing how popular like just between uh harari and jared diamond like just like my god like that, that's a lot of people who are curious in really admirable ways about the world and thinking big and about social theory you know who just end up with very little except right. for you know a cute story to tell at the end of the airport the airplane ride right right um well daniel i think that's probably a, a good spot to end this but before we go bef while we're talking about like demystifying 
naturalized ideas and, and things that we just take for granted. Um, pitch your book a little bit. I want to talk about, uh, ha- um, to, to talk about your book. Yeah. Um, How to hide an empire. How to hide an empire. Buzz marketing. I'll never say no. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so yeah, I mean, look, I think the, 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 the quickest pitch is this. If you ask most people to envision the United States, like in their heads, like mentally map it, most people will return a very familiar shape, the contiguous blob, right? It's right. like Mexico on one side and Canada on the other and the oceans on, on, on the left and right. And it turns out that that is an accurate map of the United States for only three years of its history. There right. are three years of US history where that's the right map. <laughs> and, and the reason, I mean, partly because the country started out smaller, but, but the reason that I really talk a lot about is that, you know, starting in the mid 19th century, the United States has claimed overseas territories and annexed them to the United States. And, you know, when we talk about US history, you don't really talk about that as something that takes place in the Philippines or Puerto Rico or American Samoa, but those are also parts of the United States. They're subordinated and they're placed on the margins, but they're, they're part of the country. And so what the book tries to do is to retell the history of the United States, but with an understanding that, you know, Puerto Rico and the Philippines are part of the United States. And it turns out that a lot comes out differently because those are places where an enormous amount of, you know, like highly consequential events take place. Um, so so that's the pitch for the book. It's a history of, of not the contiguous blob, but of what some people used to call the greater United States. Yeah. I mean, growing up, you think about, you hear that phrase, like the sun never sets on the British Empire. When you think of the British Empire, like, you know, conceptually, it's not just that island. And then it's just historically, it was this global thing. But when you apply it to America, you don't have that same conceptual uh, association there. No, I mean, I, I grew up in Pennsylvania no one at any point that I remember in my education showed me a map of the United States that had Puerto Rico on it. Right. And like, that seems like an omission. It's not even hard to put Puerto Rico on that map. You don't even have to have a separate box. It's right there. Right. Right. Um, yeah. So this was a kind of, no, that's right. The British get this, like the British know that there was a British empire, the French know the French empire. Uh, and there's a way in which people in the United States, or as I learned to call it, the U S mainlands, right. um, are, kind of willfully almost blind to the overseas, the imperial aspects of, of their own country. Yeah. Um, well, go check that out at Daniel M. Rivar, How to Hide an Empire. Um, and you can go check out this article in the New Republic. It's called The Paleocon. I believe that's the title. Paleocon. Yeah. Right. That was a good, that was not my title, but it's a very good title. I like. <laughs> yeah, it is a good one. Um, so definitely go check all that out. Daniel, thanks so much for joining us. Um, we'd love to have you back on next time. Uh, you, you find the next um, Silicon Valley guru that <laughs> is speaking. Next one I skewer. <laughs> that's Excellent. Right. That's right. Um, well, thanks again, Daniel. And uh, we'll hear from you next time. Sounds great. It's been an absolute pleasure.